Hello and welcome to Noble Mind. Noble Mind is a podcast exploring mindfulness, meditation, and psychology. Hello, listeners. In this episode, we speak with Dr. Kristen Neff about her recent work developing fierce self compassion. Fierce self compassion adds to tender self compassion the action oriented qualities of protecting, providing, and motivating. We explore how fierce self compassion relates to gender role socialization, the expression of anger, and spiritual practice. Dr. Kristen Neff is currently an associate professor of educational psychology at the University of Texas at Austin. She's a pioneer in the field of self compassion research, conducting the first empirical studies on self compassion nearly 20 years ago. She's author of the best selling book, Self Compassion. Along with her colleague, Chris Germer, she developed the Mindful Self-Compassion program, taught worldwide, and co-wrote the Mindful Self-Compassion workbook. Her newest book is Fierce Self-Compassion, How Women Can Harness Kindness to Speak Up, Claim Their Power, and Thrive. To take a self-compassion test, find research articles, or download guided meditations, you can go to www.self-compassion.org. You can also go to noblemindpodcast.com to get this episode's show notes and join our email list. Enjoy the show. We are here with Dr. Kristen Neff. Thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, happy to be here. Why don't we dive right into our conversation today about self-compassion and your new book, Fierce Self-Compassion, but we know some of our listeners may not be fully familiar with you or self-compassion generally, so maybe you could just start us off with a little bit about who you are and how you came to sort of explore and develop this idea of self-compassion. Yeah, so I've been researching self-compassion for about 20 years now, and it really is my life's work. I certainly didn't come up with the idea. I learned about self-compassion from a group that taught in the tradition of Thich Nhat Hanh when I was learning mindfulness meditation, um, and he talks a lot about self-compassion. Really, in the Buddhist tradition, it's just expected that you show compassion inward as well as outward. And so I started practicing about 25 years ago, and it, it just made a huge difference. I was going through a lot of stress at the time. It made a huge difference in my ability to, to cope with some difficulties I was going through. And so when I got a job at, 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 about 20 years ago at University of Texas at Austin, I decided I wanted to research it, kind of you know, come up with an operational definition and created a measure of it and started researching it. Uh, and then about 10 years ago, I, I met a colleague named Chris Germer, who said, Kristen, it's not enough to research this. You need to teach people how to do it. <laughs> <laughs> so we collaborated and developed a training program called Mindful Self-Compassion to teach the skills. Uh, yeah, so it's, it's a, it's a full-time life's work. Wonderful, wonderful. And for anyone who hasn't taken the self-compassion test, you have it online and I yes. definitely recommend it. I know it's been helpful for me as well as for some of the clients I've worked with too. And you're the famous creator of the self-compassion test. Yes, <laughs> which means I get lots of people trying to uh, question its validity as well. So I'm also the defender of the self-compassion test. <laughs> Yeah, so, so I still do a lot of psychometrics. I'm actually revising the scale, and I've I've created like a state scale and a youth scale and a compassion scale. So it's kind of a psychometrics is kind of a sideline. <laughs> my, main, my main thing these days is uh, really teaching people how to be self compassionate. That's really what's most important. I don't need to be convinced that it helps. We know we know it helps. We know enough already. It's how to do it that's really important. Absolutely. Now, your latest book, Fierce Self-Compassion, builds on and expands your prior work. Can you tell us what, what this book adds and what it means? Yeah, so uh, it's really, and, and you know, the idea of fierce and tender self-compassion, which I promote in the book, it's, it's not something that I've differentiated in my research, these two faces of self-compassion, but, but we know from the research that self-compassion is linked to acceptance, but also taking action. And so I, I call these two sides of self-compassion fierce and tender. So the tender side of self-compassion is the accepting kind of warm, nurturing energy of self-compassion. It's about, you know, remembering that, yeah, okay, we're flawed. We make mistakes. It doesn't mean that we're a mistake. We can be warm, kind, caring, loving toward ourselves and just accept the fact that, yeah, we're flawed human beings. Life is imperfect. Uh, it's kind of the gentle energy. Uh, unfortunately, people tend to think that's all there is to self-compassion. But just like a parent, 
you know, with the parents, sometimes you need to be gentle, but sometimes you need to be mama bear, right? <laughs> so for instance, if someone's threatening your child, you might get very, very protective. Or if your child's doing behaviors that are harmful to themselves or others, we, we kind of try to help their, our child change. And also meeting, meeting needs, right? And this is a really important action-oriented side of compassion. If compassion is concerned with the alleviation of suffering, which is kind of an agreed upon scientific definition of compassion, sometimes to alleviate our suffering, we need acceptance. And, that, and sometimes, you know, both at the same time, we, we might accept ourselves, but we don't want to accept all our behaviors and we don't want to accept all the situations we find ourselves in. And so taking action to alleviate suffering is really key. And that might even involve getting angry, you know, say, no, you can't treat me this way. That's an act of self-compassion or saying, I would love to help you, but you know, this is really important to me and I need to take some time and spend some energy on meeting my own needs. Or and really, I mean, the, the number one block to self-compassion is people think if they're kind to themselves, they won't be motivated. It's just the opposite. <laughs> if you're kind to yourself, you're going to be motivated, but you're going to do it not because you're inadequate unless you achieve your goals. You're going to do it because you care about yourself and you want to achieve your goals. So it's a more sustainable type of motivation, but it's really more the action-oriented side. So, uh, And the reason I, I wrote the book for women, uh, because... Gender role socialization is so harmful in many ways, regardless of your gender identity, you know, because it puts people in the boxes. And it's like yin and yang. We need both. You know, we need the gentle yin and we need the fierce yang. Um, But men aren't allowed to be tender. And that really harms men. It cuts men, you know, people who are socialized as men, they aren't allowed to access the full range of their resources, like tender self-compassion to help heal themselves, to hold their pain with that kind of gentle nurturing energy that really harms men. Um, but women, on the other hand, aren't allowed to be fierce, right? We're disliked if we're fierce. We're, you know, we're, we're each called different sets of names. If, we're, if women are fierce or men are too tender, when the reality is everyone needs both and we need to balance and integrate both. So I, I wrote the book for women just because it was too much of a task to, to write because the blocks are different for men, for people yeah. who are social. It's not like real men or women, but people are socialized to be men or women. The blocks are different. So I wrote from the female point of view because that's the one I'm familiar with. But, you know, again, it really harms everyone, this lack of balance. Yeah, absolutely. And I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about how fierce compassion gets expressed. You know, you talk in the book a little bit about protection, uh, providing motivation, these sorts of things. So these are three ways that I've identified along with Chris Germer. There are probably more, you yeah. know, basically you can take any action needed to alleviate your suffering. It could take a, a lot of different forms, but the three I've worked through at least kind of theoretically in, in, the, in terms of the research literature, yes, yeah, protection. So um, drawing boundaries, for instance, is definitely a really important role of self-compassion. It doesn't mean just saying yes, doesn't mean being nice. Sometimes it means really, no, that's not okay. What actually my motivation for writing the book stemmed directly from the Me Too movement. I had an experience where, um, you know, I encountered someone who was really, you know, basically Me Too, (laughs) at least to the woman I was involved and close to. Mm -hmm. And I was so angry about it. And I realized my anger about this, this is an act of self-compassion, right? This is saying, you can't treat us this way. You can't treat women this way. It's not okay. This isn't a right. So, so, and getting angry, you know, anger gets a bad rap, especially I think sometimes in, in spiritual circles, it's like, well, we need to hold our anger or, you know, work with it wisely. Well, yeah, of course you do need to try to work with it wisely, but anger aimed at the alleviation of suffering is compassion. Mm-hmm. It's only when anger causes suffering and harm that it's against compassion. And, you know, it's, it's hard. It's, it's a difficult emotion. It's hard to, hard to harness, but anger has a place. It must have a place. There's a reason that it evolved. This really important protective emotion. So talk and women and women aren't allowed to get angry, which again, really harms women. You know, oh, well, that's just the way men are. That's just, that's just the way we're raised. You know, it's like, screw that. <laughs> you know, it's like, no, it's not okay. No. And then also again, providing again. So yeah, men have slightly more com- self-compassion than women, even though 85% of the people who show up to my workshops are women mm-hmm. because compassion is a girl thing, right? Mm-hmm. Based on gender role socialization. But ironically, women don't feel as entitled to meet their own needs. Mm -hmm, So, mm -hmm. you know, it's not that men are so self-compassionate. It's just that women, the imbalance for women between compassion to self and others is larger because we're raised to be compassionate to others. 
but not ourselves. So part of this is saying my needs are important too, not more important, but not less important either. Uh, and then motivating change. So yeah. Really appreciate you sharing some of your personal stories and experiences in, in this book, as well as your previous work really yeah. helps us kind of relate to it in a way that's very humane and real and not kind of overly yeah. intellectual. There's wonderful, great, rich ideas in the books as well. And especially as a woman, <laughs> you know, reading yeah. it and thinking about my own experiences of kind of trusting men and having an experience of feeling like, oh, that trust was maybe... Uh, I ought not to have trusted that person. Right. Yeah. And, and so, and, and it doesn't mean that we're responsible for it. Of course not. You know, a, on the other hand, on the other hand, we can't wait around and just hope that the world is going to start to become just on its own. You know, right. we need to, <laughs> the first thing we need to do is see clearly what's happening. Yeah. And if we brush it under the table because we're socialized as women, just to be nice and to be understanding and, you know, and don't rock the boat. Mm -hmm. That's certainly not helping the situation. Mm -hmm. So we have a role to play. Although again, so it's not like we have to, we shouldn't, shouldn't blame ourselves for it. And the responsibility doesn't lay on us. And yet it's not going to happen on its own. We need right. to be active in breaking ourselves out of some of these constraints, because again, no one else is going to do it for us. Yeah. How have you noticed women readers so that have responded to the book so far that you've spoken with? Yeah. So, uh, you know, a lot of the people I've spoken with, it, you know, it's, I think it points to what a lot of women have been feeling. Like, you know, there's a lot of books out there on women's anger and kind of this movement. I think women, it's, it's, a, it's a big cultural movement is another, yeah. you know, people call it another, the next feminist wave. I mean, in some ways, it's interesting. We had the whole Me Too movement. And I think there's less attention on it because, you know, quite rightly, the anti-racism movement is equally important. And by the way, we can't even separate them right? Oppression is oppression. So the same principles that go into anti-sexism are the same ones that go into anti-racism or anti-wealth you know, inequality, anti-global warming. These are all compassion movements. They're all about the alleviation of human suffering. And so they're all intertwined. But I, I do know that for a lot of women I've talked to, it helps kind of maybe put a, a framework to help understand what's what's happening and why why it can be difficult for us to access our anger or to say no to others or to feel like we have to be these superhumans who you know work and take care of the kids and do the dishes and all this stuff and kind of just say, hey, that's that's not okay. Mm -hmm. I don't want to, you know, it's not okay for me to do everything like this. And also I think the question, well, where does it come from? Because these these gender roles are um, really deeply embedded in us, and oftentimes we aren't. A lot of them are implicit, and we do it to other women. Do it to other women as well. It's not just like men somehow are stereotyping us. These stereotypes, gender is one of the very first categories infants learn. Well mm -hmm. before all these other types of categories come into play, gender is like you know, in the womb we're gendered, mm -hmm. right? And it's yeah. kind of one. It's probably. I think I feel comfortable saying it's probably the earliest stereotype that's applied to us because it goes in, you know, before we were even Absolutely. born. Absolutely. And so it, it's, it's effects are so pernicious and that we need to be aware of them. And I, I do, you know, I hope the book kind of helps. It's not about gender roles. It's about self-compassion, but you can't really understand the blocks to self-compassion unless you also understand gender roles from my point of view. I was struck when reading it that, as, as you said, it is relevant to all oppressions it which is. have this power dynamic. Yes. So, so it would apply to ableism, LGBTQ plus oppression. Yes. It's all down, the, down the, the, the whole list, really. Yeah. So um, it's been interesting. So my dis back, back before I got involved in self-compassion, I was what I did research on was how power inequality shapes the balance of personal prerogative and interpersonal obligation in relationships. And so you can see in some ways, you know, especially when tenderness is aimed towards helping others, people who with less power are socialized to always help others. And people with more power are socialized that they have prerogatives, personal prerogatives, and they get their rights and needs met. And so those same dynamics, in some ways, you can say, I mean, it's not exactly the same, but there's some overlap in terms of this fierceness and tenderness uh, relating to power dimensions. Now, of course, it's so complicated because of intersectionality, you know, within like gender operates within racial groups, for instance, or disability status operates within groups. So 
there's not one easy picture mm-hmm. um, that you can say, and it doesn't apply to everyone with certain patterns of intersectionality the exact same way. I, I do like the yin and yang metaphor, though, because I like it because it's neutral. You know, at least we, I mean, it can be gender, but you can think of it, it's more easy to think of it as, as neutral, the yin and yang energy, the accepting, gentle, and the, the fierce active energy. These are human qualities. Mm-hmm. And when you start getting power relationships and stereotypes and culture and all that, basically we're, <laughs> we're messing with the people's ability to find balance. And that's part of the problem. Mm-hmm. And so for me, an act of self-compassion includes making sure your yin and yang, your fierceness and tenderness is in balance, regardless of the react. People aren't going to necessarily like you. For instance, people don't like fierce women. Mm-hmm. Look at Elizabeth Warren and Amy Klobuchar. They had to apologize for being so fierce in the presidential you know, debate that they had. And it's true. They are going to like you less. And so you have to make a choice. Am I going to be authentic and whole? Or am I going to have people like me? <laughs> and there may be some context where you, you know, maybe in the work context, maybe you don't have a choice. Maybe you do have to, you can't speak up. You know, that, that's reality. It's not like you have to owe us. It may not be what's best for you in this situation. Maybe in some situations you do have to stay silent, which is sad, but then you need, hopefully you can try to work to change the system. Um, so I'm, I'm not saying pre- prescribing people's behavior, but at the very least, we should be aware of what's going on and see it clearly. To further elaborate for listeners, when you when you talk about tender compassion, you're talking yeah. about the energy of nurturing. So, yeah, warmth, softness, gentleness, soothing, reassuring, validating, accepting. Being with internal experience. Fierce compassion, you're talking about the the energy of action. So it's it's maybe there's a bit more to fierce than with what first maybe evoked in a person's mind. So it's action oriented, goal oriented. Yes. Um, agency with yes agency so there's a lot of overlap with the gender stereotype literature which kind of talks about agency and communion a Mm -hmm. lot of overlap because they aren't exactly the same but there's a lot of overlap this basic dichotomy it comes up almost everywhere you know it seems to be a really basic dichotomy but the crazy thing is that we split it between people because these are everyone needs both You know, and sometimes the mindfulness world, and by the way, this is not, you know, the mindfulness world is very well aware of this. One of the problems is if it's too focused on acceptance and making space for things and not resisting, which is absolutely very true in terms of emotions. And we can see what happens when we resist negative emotions, they get worse and all that. People sometimes forget that 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 has no implications for your behavior. Mm-hmm. accepting your moments moment to moment thoughts and experiences in a mindful way has no implications of whether or not you take action for instance to correct social mm-hmm. injustice or you know people forget that because we're kind of we're kind of simple and it seems like oh we're either accepting or we're changing no we're doing both and the more we accept ourselves and the more we accept our moment to moment experience the more able we are to take action in a way that's effective You know, and so there's a lot of social justice movements in the mindfulness world is people saying, you know, hey, no, if you're thinking it's all about sitting on your cushion and being Zen, that's actually not what it's about. It's about the alleviation of suffering, but we need to do it as much as possible with a a balanced mindset. I can Um, think, yeah, from my own experience also that the two really do work together, that it's so much easier to be brave and active and out there in the world using my voice when I know I'm going to have a soft place to land and be kind and tender to myself if I, exactly. you know, if things go awry. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. We, we do. We really need the, my book is almost ad nauseum. I talk about balance, balance, balance. Um, but that's the truth, right? Yeah. I'm also struck a person who knows the dictionary definition of self compassion or self compassion may not realize that this, you're really opening a door and a path to something much larger. Um, yes. What they may think. Yeah, I think sometimes people think self compassion is just about mental well being, and it is mm-hmm. largely about mental well being. Just like mm-hmm. a lot of people with mindfulness, they think of mindfulness as just a way to manage your stress. Um, but really, if you take these deep enough, these are spiritual practices because, so for instance, I've got three components in my model of self compassion, which has actually worked out pretty well because it, it turns out that when teaching self compassion, if you take the three components, the first is mindfulness. You have to be aware of pain in order to open your heart to it. Common humanity, 
right? It's not just about me. It's about just the fact that we're human beings and imperfection and, and struggle is part of the human condition. And then there's the warmth and kindness. Any one of these on their own is not really enough. It's not sufficient. But if you look at the common humanity one, I call it common humanity because those are words people can understand. But I was developing this model when I was uh, very deep into Buddhist practice and understanding interbeing and interconnection and no self. And if you actually look at that common humanity component, it really points straight to no self. And if you look at kindness, it, it points straight to universal love. And if you look at mindfulness, it points straight to awakening. So all of these things, if you take them deep enough, it's the big opening, but it can be done at a small level as well. You don't have to believe that in order to get something out of the practice. Yeah, so your book details really how self-compassion can lead to living authentically, empowerment, being fulfilled, uh, and changing the status quo across the board. Mm -hmm. So that, that's a big remit. But, I, I'm <laughs> but you know, and but the nice thing is also, you know, I close my my book with this chapter on being the compassionate mess because, yeah, I mean, the the power of it is actually astounding. What we can achieve with it is astounding, and yet it's not like we we get to this place of getting it all together and then we're we're all together. I mean, I, I'm still a mess after 25 years of practice. I still get it wrong all the time. You know, I get a moment of balance and I get off balance and I need to apologize and you know. <laughs> I mean, it's really a way of relating to your moment to moment experience. So it doesn't, it's not like this destination we have to reach. It's like a way of living every moment of your life. And so when you think of it that way, it seems a little less, I don't know, big, it seems more small, more doable. And it really is doable because it is just every moment. How am I relating to this moment right now? Is my heart open? Am I remembering my connection? The, the fact that the sense of separate self is actually an illusion. Uh, and I'm and by being aware of what's going on. Um, I wonder if there's any starting places that come to mind if people are listening and thinking this fierce self-compassion thing sounds useful, but what do I do? Yeah, well, so the starting place, first of all, you've got to go to where the pain is because uh, compassion by definition is aimed at the alleviation of suffering, right? I mean, there's great stuff about positive psychology and gratitude and all those things. Those are great. It's just not within the sphere of self-compassion. By definition, it's, you know, passion means to suffer in the Latin. How am I with come my suffering passion? So really you can start where the pain is. Maybe the pain is I can't practice this self-compassion stuff. It's too confusing. Okay. That's interesting. That's, that's difficult. Mm -hmm. How are you relating to that difficulty? Mm -hmm. And then also another way to start is what do I need right now? Now, of course, we don't always know what we need, but just asking the question is huge. Because most of us aren't taught to even ask the question. We just go along with the program. Oh, I'm supposed to do this. I'm supposed to be that. I'm supposed to get married and have kids and get a job and then have my 401k and then, you know, I'll be happy, <laughs> you know, without ever pausing along the way to say, well, what do I really need? What's really right for me at this moment? Um, I've experienced people being kind of intimidated by that question and sometimes just like, what might I prefer or like, what could I want or, you know, just... It's a very challenging to explore that if you haven't, like you said, been socialized really to check in with yourself that way. Yeah, exactly. And it's and by the way, it's not a necessarily an easy answer or a set answer. It's really a moment. It's really a moment to moment answer. Yeah, yeah. You know, and we'll get it wrong all the time. Again, we'll be the mess, and we'll, it's about how you relate to getting it wrong. Uh, it's really it's really a process as opposed to a particular answer. And also your book, an audio book, it's, it's not just about concepts, but contains a whole bunch of practices. Yes, it's really about, you know, again, so the concepts are useful. The research is useful, but I'm mainly about the practice because the research and the concepts are, are useful for <laughs> pointing us toward practice and kind of allaying our fears. Yeah, it really is worth it. And, you know, it makes sense. OK, but now just do it and see what happens. That's, that's really the ultimate goal. And I think, you know, so I'm retiring from academia at the end of this year. Mm -hmm. And more and more, it's just, I'm, I just want to help people do this. I feel like I've, I've done enough trying to convince people if you aren't on board, that's fine, you know, but I, <laughs> enough people are on board that I really want to focus on, okay, well, how do we, how do we practice this? Because that's what it is, it's a practice. That raises really interesting questions about like what legitimizes 
you know, a practice or knowledge or experience. And, you know, for some people, they really need to look at the research and the science and, yeah. but that's not it for everyone. <laughs> right. No, that's, that's true. Well, and also a lot of people believe a lot of stuff without any research, you know, so I don't, I don't think science has all the answers, but when people do pseudoscience, when they pretend to use science, you know, I, I, for instance, I think the non-rational world, I'm totally open to it, like shamanism, all these things, it has its own way of accessing the truth. It's only when it starts pretending to be scientific. Right, and right. It's not, but the real problems come in. I, I don't, I'm totally okay with different ways of knowing. But the reason the science has been so helpful for self-compassion is because all these really entrenched misconceptions we have, it's going to make us selfish. It's going to make us lazy. It's going to make us self-indulgent. It's, you know, all these things which the research clearly shows, no, it's actually just the opposite. It makes us, it makes us stronger. People think it'll weaken them. It makes us stronger, it makes us more motivated, you know, it makes us less selfish. It makes us less self-focused. And that's really useful for people with those who've kind of bought into cultural messages about problems with self-compassion. I was really struck by how the practices are able to evoke, perhaps awaken, certain well, energies or mind states, like a sense of connection, a sense of courage. It's like sort of plugging yourself into the wall and so all of a sudden there's, there's power. Where is this coming from? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's interesting. Yeah, it's, um, you know, so the fierce self-compassion practices are more new. Most of them are adapted from the mindful self-compassion program, but with the spin focusing on more that young, active energy. Um, but I'm actually working now, now with, with Chris Germer on developing a follow-up to the Mindful Self-Compassion Program, which is going to be focused on the fierce self-compassion practices. I'm sure more will be developed that are even better. And you know what I mean? It's like it's it's it took us a long time to develop MSC. I'm sure it'll take us a while to get the practices right. But yeah, so as you said, it's not it's not that difficult. That's the thing, none of this is that difficult. Well, and the reason it's not that difficult is because we already have experience with it toward others. So for instance, we already have experience protecting those we love. You know, if yeah. someone threatens your kids, you know what to do. You don't have to think a lot about it. You know, so that energy is already within us. It's just, it's really more about finding ways to help people give themselves permission to do it with themselves. Awesome. But it's not really developing a new set of skills, which is partly, whereas like mindfulness, for instance, for most people, that really is a new set, set of skills. And you're also going against the default mode network. And it's it's challenging. I and mean, we have moments of it naturally, but it's a little more challenging. But especially the kindness part, it's not so much developing a new set of skills. It's more just remembering to turn them inward. Right. It's interesting because a person who may feel that they lack courage or assertiveness or motivation you explain quite well how when people are dissuaded from connecting with their anger yes i mean so a lot of the books about my own struggle with anger and you know if you were to meet my mom it's like i love my mom to death but you know i come by it honestly <laughs> it's a reactive anger it just it just runs in the family and kind of for years kind of being being a little ashamed of it you know here i'm this mindfulness and compassion teacher and I'm you know I'm getting swept away by reactive anger and I'm not supposed to do that and try to, I try to hold it in mindfulness and you know the self-compassion practice has been incredibly useful for dealing the shame with the shame that arises and we don't the shame is different than self-judgment I might not judge myself for doing that I might fully understand it but shame is just like a biological evolutionary state that arises you know so self-compassion helped me hold that shame but really what I started seeing, and it was especially in response to this Me Too situation I found myself in, where I had to shut down a predator and it was really horrible. But that same energy that leads to sometimes my anger being reactive is I wouldn't trade it for anything. I, you know, I would like to harness it a little more skillfully, of course, but it's, it's my power source. You know, it's like the lava bubbling up in <laughs> me is what creates, a, you know, that the heart springs. It's like it's allowed me to give the energy to do my work, you know, motivates me to do my work in the world. It's helped me speak up, to assert myself, to, um, yeah, I think really to, to contribute in the best way I can to the world. And you can't separate them. You can't like just say, cherry, cherry pick and say, okay, I'm going to... Um, just have the good bits of the anger, but it's never going to be out of control. It's like, well, good luck with that one. Maybe some people are able to, most are. I'm certainly not. 
And so really learning, you know, and, and it's very true in that if I were to take you to my bedroom, you can see I've got that picture of Kali over my meditation cushion. Who's, you know, I think for many women, we can relate to that picture and Kali who, who chops off heads and is very fierce, but really those heads are represent the ego. Mm -hmm. And what she does is destroy the illusion of separation. And yeah. anger is off. It is really evolutionarily a protective emotion, which means mm -hmm. it's actually trying to help. And yeah, yeah. You, know, you know, not yes, I know all the problems of anger and all that, and I talk about it extensively. And yet we need to bow down to our anger and say, thank you, anger. Thank you for being this force of protection and love and care within me. And yeah, maybe you could maybe you could pull it back a little in the way you said that, or sort of, you know, something like that. But but we especially for a woman, you know, most so many women, I mean, men are, you know, the research shows clearly men are respected when they get angry. People believe angry men. Women are ridiculed for being angry and people don't believe angry women. It's really, it's messed up. Yeah. <laughs> I, I just really appreciate all you're talking about anger and gender in this new book. It's been very helpful to me. And, and also I know for just my own experiences, there's, it feels so un, unfamiliar or out of control to get angry, you know, if yes. you're, if you start to open up to it at all, because then it's like, this is so it's like a trying to ride a the whole tiger or something, right? It's in, if yeah. you spent your whole life socialized to stuff it, so women say they were overtaken by their anger. Yeah. We were so, it's like, oh, that's not me. That's some alien force. Right. Yeah, Whereas if yeah. we were to own it and say, yeah, part of me is really, you know, it's always just part of us. We've got different parts. Part of me is really angry. Then, you know, but but it is, I mean, it's one, it's a very difficult emotion to work with because it, you know, on purpose, evolutionarily, is supposed mm -hmm. to overtake you. And, mm -hmm. You know, it suppresses some of that rational thinking and makes you very brave, you know, so that you don't think. <laughs> Well, actually, it's quite scary. <laughs> you, know, you know, like if, right. if, a, if, a, if an animal was to attack your child, the anger would arise and you mm -hmm. wouldn't think, well, it's probably not wise of me to fight that lion. You would just be fighting that lion. So, that it's, you know, there's a purpose to it. Um, but we really do need, I think, to respect it because like I say, it's, it's a face of love. These are it's yeah. all these, anything in the service of compassion is a face of love. But yes, it's, it's difficult to work with. It's tricky. And we don't want to use this to justify, you know, biting on people's heads or anything like that. And, you know, anything can be used, misused. Mindfulness can be misused. Compassion can be misused. Anything can be misused. We also have to be a, the lookout. Is, our, is, our, is my tricky brain trying to like manipulate the situation here? And it often does. So we need to be careful. But I do think, especially in, in the mindfulness world, the spiritual world, we have to be really careful that we don't demonize anger or just think of it as a yeah. bad thing because it's associated with so many good things yeah. as well. Yeah. I think just sort of committing to be, for me at least, just not stuffing it anymore and trying to learn yeah. to work with it and it kind of explore it and ask it like, where's the wisdom here? What's the, you know, right. what's the protective energy that's, you know, wanting to come out and then, you know, it's going to take some time to figure out how to do it skillfully. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I'm sure I won't get it figured out when I'm old, but you know, if, but again, it's really that process. If we can, that's the nice thing about self-compassion. We can give up the agenda of getting it right all the time. We won't. Yeah. But can we work with it in a way that, you know, moment by moment when it arises, like me, I'm, I'm really quick to apologize. Occasionally I catch myself. I do. It's getting better with time, <laughs> but I have no, it takes me five seconds to say, well, I was out of line. I'm really sorry. I don't try to defend it or hide it or anything. But again, like I said, I wouldn't trade it for anything because I know that's part of myself that is directly tied into my energy in the world, which has led to some good, I think. I want to make sure I, I mention that doing the exercises, the guided practices, the experience I have is instead of sort of constructing something from matches, like some large edifice, it's more about sort of being connected to considerations on oneself and just, it's just sort of coming online as a sort of I have this experience. Interesting, right? And a lot of the men I've, I've talked to, and maybe that's the same for you, Alex, have said the practices, I mean, the practices are for everyone. The practices aren't gendered. Because the practices are all about balance. The book is written more for a woman, because like I say, I think 
from people socialized as men that the blocks are different. You'd have to write a different type of book, but the practices are the same for everyone. Mm -hmm. From my point of view, it's really about accessing these energies. Well, you know, from the, from the perspective of Chinese philosophy, yin and yang, these two energies, this is just part of life. We didn't invent them. We don't own them. We don't, we certainly don't control them. Um, but we, as much as possible, need to be open to both of them and try to balance them and ask, am I missing one or the other right now? Would it help if I brought in some of the other energy explicitly? Uh, just like we could do that with the three components of self-compassion, you know, okay, am I mindful? Am I remembering my common humanity? Am I being kind to myself? And it helps. It helps to do that explicitly. Mm, nice. We really appreciate you taking some time today to talk to us. And if people want to learn more about self-compassion, fierce self-compassion, you, your research, anything, where should they go? What should they do? Well, so I've created a website, selfcompassion.org. You can spell it any which way. I've, I got in early, so all Google, all Google searches lead to me, my website. Yeah, so you can take the self-compassion scale. I have a ton of guided practices, all for free. I research a lot of original research articles on there. I've got some videos and also links to training, especially to the Center for Mindful Self-Compassion. You can link to there from my website which is kind of the training arm of what I do. And you can take online training if you're interested. So a lot of free resources and it's, it's really the best place to start, I think. Great, thank you so much. This has been just lovely. You're welcome. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for listening today. If you enjoyed this episode, we hope you'll hit subscribe, leave us a great rating or review and spread the word. You can also go to noblemindpodcast.com to join our email list. You'll get a weekly behind-the-scenes message, news, announcements, and other special goodies we come up with just for you. Thanks for listening, and bye for now.